there we go. <laughs> Hi. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our um, noon session. I'm Joan Antunis. I will be hosting this session. And um, the topic is crime in the time of COVID-19. And um, let's see, I want to make sure that I have Okay. what I will do, Serena, would you like to go first, given that? Yes, OK. I think I know, given oh. that I, I, our first set of panelists don't seem to be here yet. 
and so we can we can go on the way. Um, I will set the timer for about nine minutes, and then, you know, depending on where we're at, you may hear me go one more minute left, or if not, um, you're go you're good to go. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Can you see my screen? Can you see my presentation? Okay. Yes, it's there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so welcome everybody to this uh, interesting panel on the effect of COVID-19 and containment policies uh, on crime. So um, the study that I would like to present today is related to one of our studies on COVID-19 containment policies, and it's related to the city of, of Los Angeles. So um, the main aim of our analysis, oh, I'm sorry, I got, um, sorry. The aim of our analysis uh, was twofold. So we want to investigate from one side whether uh, and how COVID-19 containment policies have a short term impact on crime trends in a metropolis. This uh, um, fact of short term impact is very important because we will consider short time windows after the introduction of containment policies. And from the other side, understand how well uh, available theoretical frameworks such as routine activity theory, crime pattern theory, and general strain theory are able to explain these changes. So from one side, investigate the impact on crime trends, and from the other side, to understand how well available theoretical frameworks are able to explain those changes. So according to this theory, we expect uh, that the density of social interactions would change after the introduction of uh, um, containment policies, of course. So we could expect uh, increase or decreases uh, of crime depending on the, the specific dynamics. Uh, so in the case of shoplifting, we would expect, uh, for example, a decrease. In the case of intimate partner violence, probably an increase. And then uh, uh, according to general strain theory, we can uh, expect an increase uh, of specific type of crime related to the stress generator factors that would increase uh, uh, in this specific situation of uh, containment policies. So our study is uh, focused on Los Angeles. We consider nine crime categories and the overall crime in the city of, of Chicago. So we will have uh, different type of crimes uh, as well as overall crime. Um, as uh, methods, uh, we decided to use the uh, um, Bayesian structural time series to construct, so to build a counterfactual virtual scenarios where no social distancing is uh, computed. So to better understand what would have happened in this counterfactual um, scenario. Um, e there is a uh, um, several controls that we decided to include in our analysis, temperature, for example, holidays, and we will use the diffusion regression state space which predicts this contrafactual trend in synthetic control. So the idea is to build a contrafactual scenarios where no social distancing measures has been put in place and understand how crime trend, crime series, um, will vary according to the, um, the actual scenario. So the scenario where social distancing measures has been put in place. Uh, we consider a pre-intervention period from January 2017 to uh, the beginning of March 2020. 
And of course, our post-intervention period, starting from the 4th of March, when the first mild containment policies of social distancing has been put in place in the city of Los Angeles to the 28th of March. That's why we were referring to short time period, the short time after math, after the introduction of these, uh, um, of these containment policies. Then we decided to split uh, the in two time windows uh, this uh, post-intervention period to better understand what happens when mild measures, so mild policies were put in place from the 4th to the 16th of March, and when strict measures has been put in place, considering a larger um, time windows. In this case, we can see how mobility trends uh, of driving, transit and walking in the city of Los Angeles started to change uh, before the 4th of March. And of course, the trend is even decreasing after the 16th of March, when the lockdown were put in place. So these two time windows will help us to understand the effect of these social distancing and lockdown policies on the overall crime trend. So we have a um, total amount of 700,000 observations. A higher number of theft, battery, and stolen vehicle, for example, lower number of shoplifting and homicide. Considering the all time period, so from January 2017 to the 28th of March 2020. Um, these are time series of crimes. Uh, as, as you can see in the last part of our time series, we have uh, a reduction in the series of crimes, so a temporary reduction, especially for some specific type of crimes. So, so we are going um, to impute and we are going to uh, conduct this statistical analysis to understand uh, which type of crime would change according to our hypothetic scenario uh, and to the real scenarios. As we can see here in the red, the red dots are uh, all the crime that doesn't show a significant uh, uh, difference, while the other are showing uh, significant decreasing, um, both for both time period uh, or only for one in the case of battery, for example. So we can see that for robbery, shoplifting, theft, and also for overall crime, we have a significant decrease. Robbery um, experienced the largest decrease, uh, 24%, for example, while we have no clear significant effect uh, uh, for, for example, vehicle theft, burglary, assault with deadly weapon, intimate partner by assaults and homicides. So for some type of crime, we can see significant and strong decrease from other type of crime, not significant effect. Um, so in this case, coherently with our previous um, hypothesis uh, uh, for what is concerning routine activity theory and crime pattern theory, we can see the most uh, reductions are larger after the introduction of strict containment policies. So there is a stronger and larger reduction um, of crime trends uh, related to the introduction of strict containment policies, uh, which further reduce criminal opportunities, of course, while increasing informal guardianship. So in this case, our first hypothesis, especially for specific type of crimes, uh, uh, is confirmed, so we can see this uh, shift and uh, this reduction, uh, large reduction with the introduction of strict and containment policy. In other cases, we can observe um, different type of push factors. So in, in some cases, uh, um, there is a lack of significant variation in the trends of several crimes. Mostly because it's possible that uh, there are 
pushing factors going in different directions. So, for example, in the case of uh, stolen vehicles or in the case of burglaries, uh, uh, we have different, uh, um, we, we do not see any significant decreasing because it's possible to foresee a balance between positive and negative stimulus, for example, or um, there is a difference in the factors that push towards a decrease or against a decrease. Um, what is interesting, I think, it's probably some of these mechanism would have changed in the long run. So in the short term, this is what we uh, immediately can see, but it's possible that negative stimuli, for example, as an outcome of, of the quarantine, will increase and would, uh, we would expect uh, additional decreasing or increasing of specific crime times, uh, crime uh, types uh, related to um, additional trends uh, that we could see in the future. So in this case, short period, but in the long period, we would expect that negative stimuli would push in and probably drove uh, other crimes to increase or decrease, uh, for example, in the case of domestic violence uh, or intimate partner violence. Overall, um, what I think is interesting and we were able to observe is that containment policies impacted more uh, instrumental crimes in the immediate aftermath. So in the short time period, we can see that more instrumental crimes such as uh, shoplifting, theft, robbery were affected the most uh, compared to more expressive uh, motivational crime uh, such as, for example, uh, intimate partner violence or, uh, for example, homicide. Um, this is um, mainly because strong motivation and low self-control play a more central One minute. Uh, role in explaining a more serious crime, uh, whereas uh, criminal opportunities uh, help us to better understand uh, the dynamics of less serious offenses. So in the short term, uh, more impact on instrumental crime, uh, less impact on expressive crime. General reflections is needed uh, on um, on the role of, of course, uh, predictive policing softwares in this case that be no longer informative, uh, especially in the short terms uh, when something like that happens. Not only a pandemic, but would also foreseen uh, some changes uh, in the social uh, scenarios and also a general idea to strengthen uh, the uh, methods of distance developing distance reporting tools uh, to um, help people to be able to report crimes because of course one of the limits uh, in this case would, would be the inability of the people to be able to report crime because of the containment policies. Thank you for your attention. This is our paper that has been published uh, by the American um, Journal of Criminal Justice. Here the link is an open access paper. So um, I hope you will um, download it and have a look at it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was great. So next, um, there's a question in the Q&A, which we can address afterwards at the end. If for some reason, um, attendees, if you cannot see a question, uh, you can always post your own question in the chat since we have access to the chat as well. Um, let me see. Uh, next, we have oh, Exploring the effects and theory, uh, theoretical implications of SARS-CoV-2 containment policies. Oh, we have both. So are we, are we going to do the Chicago one next, I'm guessing? Serena, Jan Maria? 
Yeah, correct. Can you okay. hear me? Yes, I can. Take it away. All right, perfect. So let me share the screen. Okay. Should be able to see the presentation now, correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, hi everybody and thank you for being here today. Um, thank you to all the organizers for setting this uh, great uh, conference up. Uh, this is our paper uh, entitled Disentangling Community Level Changes in Crime Transferring COVID-19 Pandemic in Chicago. Um, it was basically motivated by uh, the fact that we have a lot of research in the last months uh, looking at how um, COVID-19 has, has changed um, crime scenarios in various uh, cities and various countries all over the world. Uh, however, uh, and this also relates to our publication and to the paper that Serena has just presented, uh, what people has mainly done uh, was to um, look at uh, statistics from an aggregate point of view at the city level. So we try to understand whether we can go deeper uh, and try to understand whether there are uh, other patterns in, your, in the same urban context. Specifically, the study is driven by two main questions. The first one is, are changes in criminal activity homogeneous across different areas of the same city? And the second one is, if that, if that is true, uh, if that is not true, sorry, so if changes are uh, heterogeneous, what are the characteristics of those areas that have experienced a significant reduction uh, in crime? So data and methods. Uh, we use data, open data, uh, from the uh, Chicago Open Data Portal. Um, looking at uh, crimes at the daily level, January 1st, 2018 to May 17, 2020. So uh, we will be able to gather data from um, literally like two months after the uh, uh, lockdown uh, imposition in, in Chicago. And we selected our uh, uh, limited range of crimes, in this case, not nine as in the um, Los Angeles paper. We looked at burglaries, assaults, narcotics related offenses and robberies. Uh, for a total of more than 122,000 um, offenses overall. Uh, the methodology is actually an expansion of what we did um, uh, for our Los Angeles paper. So we created this two-step methodology uh, uh, where each step was actually answering to one of our research questions that I had mentioned before. So the first research question was, are changes homogeneous over, crime, over, over the same uh, city and to uh, assess that we we actually applied a structural Bayesian time series model for to each of the 75, 77 Chicago communities and uh, for each of the crimes that we have selected to understand whether we can isolate the effect of the intervention policies to contain the virus um, on each of these uh, different territories within the same urban context, which is again Chicago. And then for the research question number two, so whether or we can find patterns or variables that correlate with the reduction uh, in, in crimes for certain areas, we employed for logistic regression, which is a technique that is able to uh, handle binary uh, target variables uh, that are highly skewed uh, with small samples, especially. And we uh, try to understand whether we can infer some patterns using set four different sets of variables. So crime related variables, socioeconomic variables, demographic and health related variables and joint effects. Joint effects, I mean, so if, whether we can find that uh, the reduction in a certain uh, crime category is also correlated to the reduction to another, uh, to another crime category. So the estimation of the RST is actually the relative cum cumulative effect. So how much uh, has the policy impacted crime compared to a counterfactual scenario? So it's a global measure of, uh, of the effect of the policy. And the estimation led to these results for burglary, for example, uh, crime significantly dropped only in 10 uh, communities. Uh, out of 77 with two communities that also showed uh, a statistical increase, a major statistical increase in one case plus 219% uh, and the other case plus 168% respectively. Uh, so there's this mixture of results in the, in the case of burglaries, which I think what concerned assaults, a total of 18 um, communities actually experienced significant reductions with only again reporting an increase and again, major increase in assaults. And then for what concerns narcotics, narcotics are a type of 
category that actually require a more uh, uh, statistically significant reduction across the uh, communities in Chicago with the almost um, with almost 50%. We have a 45.4% of, of communities that actually experience uh, a decrease in, 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 in narcotics related crimes. This is probably due to a change also in policing patterns within the same city. Um, and most of the communities that actually experienced significant reduction in Chicago were the, the communities that were characterized by high levels of crime before the pandemic. For what comes to robberies in the end, we have only a minority, so uh, 10, um, 10 communities that actually experienced uh, significant reductions, and they were mostly clustered in the north side and central districts of the city. A, a visualization of what actually was, uh, I was saying before, for burglaries and assaults. So the top maps actually map the significant changes when the community is blue. It means that it actually, uh, the policy actually led to significant changes, uh, while the red ones are not, and in both directions. So both increases and decreases, while the uh, bottom maps actually tells us the, um, the magnitude of the relative community effect in terms of percentage. So how much or how much it changed it after after the imposition of restriction due to COVID-19 uh, within the same city. And this is for burglaries and assaults, but we also have that for narcotics and robberies. And we can see that, for example, for narcotics, there is a, a much more present uh, uh, role of, of the interventions in, in reduction in the reduction of crime with a large share of, of communities that are actually colored blue. It means, again, that there was, there was significant change. And for the specific case of narcotics, significant change actually overlaps with significant reduction. So now the second part of our results regarding what factors can we uh, look at when we want to understand what drove uh, actually reduction in crime. And for the set of models, looking at crime related correlates, we have two main results. So the first one is that the presence of a police station within the boundaries of the same community didn't have any effect in the reduction of crime, which I think is, is relevant. Um, and the second one is that had the higher number of assaults in 2019, the higher the likelihood of reduction in the same category. These same relationships actually actually for uh, the number of robberies. What does that mean? It means that communities with high levels of assaults and robberies before the pandemic have witnessed larger drops. So actually it was were uh, uh, more uh, impacted in a positive way disproportionately compared to other compared to other communities in the same city. What concerns socioeconomic correlates is that population is the uh, only variable that is actually positively correlated uh, with the with the reduction in all the considered crimes, and this is probably due to the uh, link to uh, routine activity and uh, theory and the idea that probably more people at home mean uh, means enhanced guardianship uh, that actually uh, in, uh, increases the risk for uh, offenders to commit crimes in those areas where people are staying at home actually. So. The first result that we have the fact that income diversity negatively negatively impacts on reduction of burglaries and robberies, and it's probably due to uh, the role of relative deprivation in somehow avoiding uh, the uh, the reduction of, of these two types of crime in areas where there is a large gap large gap in inequality. So uh, very diverse uh, neighborhoods in terms of of, uh, of economic uh, possibilities and 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 heterogeneous communities in financial uh, in the financial scenario. So this is the second result. The third one is that poverty is again negatively associated with reduction in burglary. So this case is more the role of absolute deprivation and uh, poverty is also positive related reduction in narcotics related offensive and assaults, which are two crimes that are less related to the economic uh, uh, dimension of, of, of criminal decision making. Demography and health. Um, communities with seniors are less likely to experience disruption in injuries. Uh, this might mean that probably the role of vulnerable targets uh, is, how, is somehow uh, influencing the patterns that we see in the data. Um, then a, a second result that is somehow related is that the fact that the communities with higher presence of youth are actually experiencing lower probabilities in assault reduction. And I think is, is again another important uh, that connects uh, how crime is actually embedded in, in the uh, social uh, and demographic uh, um, texture of a, of a certain community. And then the third one is that the COVID-19 cases rate, nor the COVID-19 cases rate, nor the COVID-19 death rate predict any, anyhow, 
a reduction in any crime. So this goes against the fear compliance hypothesis proposed by two uh, groups of scholars in other disciplines that said that actually probably the number of cases in a certain area can predict whether people comply with rules, people will be able to stay at home and people will be able to, for example, connect it to crime, commit less, less crime. So this goes against instead the fear compliance hypothesis. So COVID-19 cases, do not have any kind of relation with the ability of uh, significantly see a reduction in, in crime. And finally, joint reduction, we see that uh, there are two joint reductions here. The reduction in burglaries correlates uh, with reduction in robberies and vice versa. And then we also, uh, the, the correlation between reduction in assaults are actually uh, associated with reduction in narcotics related offenses. Um, and I think there are, there is something going on here. I mean, the interesting part of these two results is that again, burglaries and robberies, which are two uh, types of appropriative crimes are connected together, where assaults and narcotics related are motivated by other types of offending decision-making processes are again, are again, together, also in the production models. So conclusions and implication to um, wrap up and, and finalize what, uh, what the presentation was about. So three main conclusions and implications here, I think the present study first indicates that the policies um, to con issues to contain COVID-19 did not impact Chicago's communities homogeneously. So we have different effects. We have uh, a min minorities of, of communities that are actually uh, favored by these uh, policies, while a lot of other communities didn't see any kind of a significant change in, in crime trends at the daily level. Uh, furthermore, uh, the study suggests that there are crime, criminal, socioeconomic, demographic, health, and joint effect factors that can actually contribute in explaining these different trends that we see in crime reduction after the imposition of COVID-19 policies uh, over the uh, 77 communities in Chicago. And we also think that the results may be relevant to inform public policies related to policing and resource allocation, crime prevention in these uh, active and actually dramatic periods, where to understand we can find tailored policies that can um, that can benefit uh, that from, from which uh, communities can benefit uh, to actually uh, be able to contain new trends and new patterns that we see both at the temporal and at the graphic. This is the resource information that the presentation is based on uh, the work that is contained in this paper that was recently published uh, in Crime Science. I want to thank uh, Alberto, Serena, and Alex Piquero for their contribution to this paper, which uh, again is open access and you can find the uh, data to access it here. And uh, thank you for your attention uh, and thank you again for uh, organizing this great conference. Thank you so much for the great contribution. Thank you. Diego da Rosa Santos, you're up. Okay. I will share my screen. Everybody seeing my screen? Looks good. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Diego, and I'm part of the Contemporary Criminology Institute group. And I'm here today to present the study developed this year, which deals with the economy and criminality in the city of Porto Alegre, Brazil, during the first six months of social isolation due to the coronavirus disease pandemic. So uh, my object of this investigation was the crimes of Lurton and Harbury in the city of Porto Alegre during the months from March to July. And the objectives are to identify the relationship between social isolation and crimes of Lurton and Harbury, uh, collect data on occurrence of these crimes, income and employment data, income transfer data, and social isolation rate uh, our objective to test the economic theory of crime by Gary Becker and seek corroboration of the hypothesis with the statements. Uh, to reach these ob objectives, uh, the hypothetical deductive method was used. Uh, and the basic statements are uh, the coronavirus disease uh, pandemic is precursor of an economic bust. Uh, and the social isolation reduces the number of TV passers by uh, on the city streets. 
Uh, okay, to do it, the conjectures are from Gary Becker's economic theory and also the general theory by Keynes. And it's, uh, it's also important to know some revisions of the Becker's theory, such as the idea that Larson and Harbor are sensitive to economic busts. That was reviewed by Posner in 1985. And unemployment has a direct relationship with property crimes that was reviewed by Myers Jr. in 1983. And police force has a direct relationship with reducing crimes that was reviewed by Fowler in 1977. So in the economic area, the projection uh, in Brazil is a drop of 11% in GDP compared to the same period in the last year. This results in a sharp drop in consumption and consequently employment and common reduction, the, as seen by the general theory by Keynes. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the government acted quickly by creating common transfers programs uh, in the Keynesian model to avoid the sharp drop in consumption. And these were the amounts that are transferred by government uh, in the period from March to July. So from that, we can make some deductions. Uh, so income transfers are capable of and only of equaling consumption to that observed just before the beginning of social isolation, never to exceed it. Uh, the logical inference would uh, be to observe a slight increase in crimes and of Lusser and harboring in case of mitigation or maintenance of the average in case of equivalence. Meanwhile, Larson and Harbor crimes have sharply decreased in the period. So there's a new fact what's not considered by Beckers when he formulated his theory. So this is the social isolation. Uh, here is the historical series for crimes of Larson and Harbor in the city of Porto Alegre. Uh, this is blue Larson and orange Harbor. Uh, note the strong reduction from the month of March. Uh, now we can compare this with the historical series of uh, social isolation. Uh, it's possible to note there is a similarity between the two figures. Uh, when the social isolation rate goes up, uh, there is a decrease in the occurrence of these crimes. Uh, to falsify these observations, uh, a standard economic econometric model was created. Uh, the hypothesis is the Larson and Harbor crimes are likely to decrease as the rate of social isolation increases, but not to the same proportion. Uh, the conclusions of the econometric model are, uh, this is a very strong and indirect relationship between crimes of Larson and Harbor with the social isolation. It is, uh, there are more isolation, less crimes. Uh, at 10% significance, there is no evidence that the result is a matter of chance, that is, statistically significant with 90% confidence. 89.3% of Larson crimes are explained by the variation in the social isolation. And 81.8% .8 of harbor crimes are explained by the variation in the social isolation. So we have some corroborations. Uh, the conclusions do not confirm the conjectures of the economic theory of crime. However, there is evidence of indirect deterrence. It's possible that the reduction in passers by increases the state of vigilance, and this increases the chance of detention. Uh, this also shows that increasing the chance of detention is more effective in deterrence than making the punishment more severe. Uh, so there is there's the reference that I use in these presentations. And there is my contact info and website of the study group. You can check it out in greenlab.com. Thank you so much, Green Lab uh, and the attendees. Thank you so much for that awesome presentation. Um, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. And I actually have a question for the attendees. Can you see the questions that have been posed in the Q&A? Please drop a, a line in the chat. I need to make sure that we are, that we have figured out. <laughs> how things are, are going. Let's see. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alberto. All right, great. So take it away for those of you that have questions. And please um, feel free to 
post in the Q&A. I'll keep an, uh, um, a, a eye on it and make sure that all the attendees can see the questions. Okay, so uh, thank you, Remy, for your question. Uh, we were asking ourselves the same question at the beginning, and then we tried to find some answers. So um, for what is concerning uh, the not significant effect of burglary, uh, we think that the most plausible explanation is related to the fact that we were not really able to differentiate between res residential and non-residential um, burglaries. In this sense, uh, we have uh, two um, pushing factors that are going on different direction. So from one side, we would expect, according to routine activity theory and crime pattern theories, that uh, residential burglary would decrease because of increasing guardianship. And on the other side, no residential burglaries might increase uh, because of no guardianship in that case. So we think that because of these two um, factors uh, pushing in different direction, we are not able to find a significant effect in the case of burglaries. Uh, because yes, in the case of residential burglaries, for sure it would be, we would expect a decrease, but then we realized that probably in our data, we have different trends uh, that uh, are concentrated in one. So they are concentrating in, in, in the phenomenon of burglary. From what is concerning intimate partner assaults, uh, mm, uh, we think that the problems is related to um, have, have considering intim intimate partner assaults, uh, which is a crime that is quite uh, serious uh, uh, compared to others. Uh, we would expect that there would be an escalation and an increasing of uh, um, triggering factors and on strength factors that we would expect uh, a little bit later on compared to the immediate uh, aftermath. So probably we could have uh, investigated more um, domestic violence in general and some um, crime types uh, that were related to domestic violence, but not necessarily related to an assault, because we thought that probably the assaults uh, come as an escalation of events. So not considering uh, um, some episodes that are not including maybe physical interaction would have uh, affect our results. And the other probability is uh, lower level of reporting rates, uh, especially because uh, the victims uh, are cohabitant uh, with the offenders, and we would have expected probably a low level of reporting because of this. Even though uh, in Los Angeles, there is a possibility to um, online report or report from home. So um, it's something that we would probably um, would have need to investigate more related to different dynamics. So the, the fact of domestic violence with no physical interactions, I think in the immediately aftermath could have played a more important role, for example, rather than assaults, so intimate partner assaults. That's uh, my explanation for your two points that are surely very, very important and very interesting. We also had the same, we were questionings uh, about our results related to burglaries and internet pattern violence. John? Yep. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, I think. I that's a good question. Uh, I want to make uh, a brief sort of a caveat. I, I think there, that as we currently unfold this pandemic on a different uh, range of uh, societal challenges and crime is one of these, I, I think that no certain answer really exists. And that's why uh, 
something we'd like to encourage uh, people to study uh, the impact of COVID-19 on crime with different methodologies on different settings, not only the United States, uh, provided that data are actually available, of course. Uh, because uh, again, depending also on the time frame that one uh, is, is actually looking at, we might have different results. So uh, that was actually one of the uh, main points that we talked about when we decided to write this paper. And that was actually what motivated us to look at uh, the, ge the meso level at uh, the meso level scale at the geographical from the geographical point of view because aggregate time series can tell a lot but uh, maybe we're uh, we we should like uh, try to understand the complexity within the same urban context and that's why we we decided to look at at that uh, that type of, of level of of detail and now I I, I come to the to to the, to the question uh, and I think yes policing certainly has a role. Uh, but that's not the only um, social process or not the only phenomenon that actually has a role in explaining uh, some, some decreases or increases in crime. I think there are many um, uh, complementary explanations that should be taken into account. Uh, not only crime has been affected by the pandemic, but uh, a lot of other types of, of behaviors and, and societal interactions and police was actually, of course, part of the of, of the number of different bodies and institutions that were uh, hit by, by this coronavirus pandemic. And in turn, this probably changed how, how police worked during these months. Um, there were, I remember, articles uh, on a number of different American cities uh, where police officers and enforcement agents were actually asked to uh, be cautious in what kind of crime to persecute, persecute or to what kind of crime to investigate uh, during these hard times. Uh, so certainly, for example, in the case of narcotics related offenses, there, there has been a, a high role, uh, a big role for, pol for policing changes uh, during the pandemic, more resources maybe to be devoted to, to to look at how um, to, I'm sorry, to, to target and to go against narcotics related crimes. Probably these in a way uh, is related to the fact that narcotics related crimes are the ones that actually um, have witnessed more reductions uh, all, over, all over Chicago. Uh, but this also connects with the, uh, what, 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 uh, what Serena was saying before, uh, that not only policing, but also crime reporting is, is something that should be taken into account. There are situations, for, ex for example, the case of intimate prior violence, where reporting might be uh, more uh, difficult than ever during uh, quarantine, for example. Uh, but also people uh, might not be able to report other types of crimes uh, during uh, um, pandemic during a pandemic where people are forced to stay at home, where people are not able to move, you know, people are actually uh, capable of going, for example, to police station to report crime uh, in, in absence of other types of technological, for example. So I think bottom line, we have to take into account a lot of, the, a lot of different factors in the explanation of how crime um, is actually impacted and influenced by, um, by the pandemic, because the pandemic is, is the, let's say, the parent node of this gigantic graph causal graph of, of factors and, and phenomena intervening. Um, and we're just looking at some, you know, um, data that are actually telling us a part of the story, but that's why a researcher is, is highly deemed now because we uh, we are far away, I think, trying to really disentangle the complex mechanics that have led to reductions or increases of crime. I mean, increases of crime are also important and I think relevant. We, didn't have the statistical power to look at those because we had really rare cases where um, crime uh, increased over over the over the time period of of, of analysis. Mm -hmm. But that is another part of of the story that should be investigated. And maybe qualitative research in that case is much more uh, interesting and much more um, relevant to, to 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 try to explain why uh, crime increased in certain areas and why crime decreased in some others. I don't know if that answers to the question, but. Um, okay, so there is also another question. Are you considering the impact of the second wave on crime and or longer periods? This is for all of us. 
So very briefly, um, we are we have discussed about this many times. Um, we don't know if you're planning to consider a second wave uh, or another study related to the second waves. What it's uh, um, the problem? I think it's methodological in this case. So it's very difficult uh, if we consider longer periods uh, to isolate the factors uh, from an econometrical point of view that are really connected with changes uh, over time. So uh, there has been social riots, uh, increasing of unemployment uh, in, in, in these months uh, related to the pandemic. So not only related to social distances and containment policies, but also related to the uh, pandemic uh, um, issues. <clears throat> so the real problem here is try to uh, isolate the effect of the condemnment policies on the social distancing, lockdowns, and so on and so forth, and all the other factors that in the middle long run could start to play an important role in shaping the crime trends. So this is uh, um, the problem at the moment because we don't still have uh, like a larger amount of data in these months so we still need to look at the daily um, time series at the same time we don't have a lot of control uh, on a daily basis uh, as you can imagine so it's difficult to isolate the very different factors so that's uh, what I wanted to say related to this. Uh, I don't know if uh, my colleagues uh, online, uh, Gian Maria or Diego, wants to add something on this, uh, otherwise. Yeah, from my, from my point of view, I totally agree with you. That's a really complex uh, point of view, especially because, um, that's a really complex point, especially because when do we know that uh, the second wave started and when do we know, for example, and that, I mean, there's a, uh, continuum here that is really difficult to uh, to define. First of all, uh, the uh, explanation of Sereno and the difficulty to find correlates in order to isolate uh, the true effects of the of the pandemic interventions. Consider that in the last months there is there have been a lot of uh, things going on, uh, especially in the United States, but not only in the United States. I mean, uh, social riots and protests, for example, have have been uh, uh, central in many other countries, Italy included. Uh, I think that this calls for action from the side of criminologists to engage with the people working in other areas, first of all, because people working in other areas may be able to uh, have access to data that should be relevant to our questions. Uh, but also... Probably uh, at monthly level, it would be... Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably that would be a, a good methodological compromise. But overall, the general message I think is also to. I mean, this is a this, this, these questions are crucial also from a policy point of view. So I think again that the role that we should have is to try to engage with other disciplines and try to engage also with policymakers and practitioners in order to make sure that what we are doing is methodologically grounded, methodologically solid, reliable, but also that can have maybe an impact, a positive impact. Um, in in trying to really unfolding the complexity of the situation, which is a, which is I think gigantic. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, I will say that all the the conclusions that we have are in our research are pre conclusions, so we only can measure the impact of the pandemic in the end of that. So in my study, I'm not considering a second wave. Uh, and I think this situation is going on and we can imagine how it will be in the end. So like, like you said, it's a very complex situation and I think the, we need to, to wait and how the things will, will going on. Um. There's also, I don't know if I have the time, but there's also another last question, uh, uh, Dominique. Um, the okay. question is, okay, the question is whether I believe or not that policing patterns will get back to the levels that they were before the pandemic. 
Um, I hope no. I mean, I hope that the terrible facts that um, happened in the United States in the last months will um, have or will influence uh, uh, a change for good. Uh, so um, I don't know if that that's a question that is more related to the um, morality and ethics of policing. That's my that's my that's my question. If the that's my answer. If the question is more related to the uh, operational patterns, strategies, and and the tactics, and in general the um, the way in which policing works, uh, then in that case I cannot really answer. Uh, I'm not the right person to 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 take this question. Uh, but my hope as a as a human, first of all, and then as a, as a scholar, is that um, the facts of the last months will uh, influence. Um, change for good uh, and for the best of course and yeah that's it thank you so much to all the attendees thank you for the great panelists this has been a pleasure to host and um good luck to everybody in their next sessions and um crimcon really appreciates your um time take care everyone thank, thank you very much. much thank you for organizing thanks Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, right. Sarah, Daniela, Stacy, I'm going to close it down and I'll open it up within five seconds because I don't want a, a mega long recording. All right. So I will be back. <laughs>